Great, and then we can kick off. So I'm really delighted to welcome everyone to this webinar. Uh, we're really excited to introduce our new call on um, technologies to enable independence for people living with dementia. And we're delighted to be joined um, by colleagues from Alzheimer's Society and um, the National Institute for Health and Care Research, who um, we are partnering with on this call. Um, I'm Catherine Freeman, a Senior Portfolio Manager from the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, um, and I work in the Healthcare Technologies team. And I'm just going to share my screen because we've got a couple of slides just to start with, um, and then a few presentations. Um, welcome everyone today, really delighted to see how many people are interested in our new funding opportunity. So I will... Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Looks good. Brilliant, thank you. So just um, to give everyone a quick overview of um, what we're going to cover today. Uh, so following this uh, short introduction, um, we will hear from Alzheimer's Society um, and some colleagues and um, people with lived experience um, to really give us an overview of the topic and why this topic is a really important area that we really need some new uh, research thinking in. Then um, myself and my colleague Sophie uh, from NHR will give a summary of the funding opportunity, the scope and the details. And then we'll have a presentation from a current Network Plus grant holder who will give some insights into how they found uh, running a Network Plus and finally, we will have a chance for everyone to ask questions, um, and that will be uh, towards the end of the webinar. And we will share the recording and the webinar, uh, the questions afterwards as well with everyone who's registered. Um, so uh, just a final thing to note, if everyone can, there's a Q&A um, button that you can press in Zoom. If you can all capture questions in there, during the webinar, that would be brilliant. And that's what we're using to um, ask the questions. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Catherine Gray, who is the head of research at the Alzheimer's Society. And I'll stop sharing my slides as well um, so we can see everyone. There we go, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. It's a pleasure to be with you all today on a very rainy day where I am. Um, so yes, we're here to sort of help set the scene um, a little bit and hopefully inspire you as you build your applications over the coming weeks. So, you know, we're only going to end the devastation caused by dementia by working in new ways and collaborating. And that's why Alzheimer's Society is really excited to be partnering on this call with the EPSRC and NIHR. So there are an estimated 1 million people living with dementia today, and that number is set to rise to 1.4 million by 2040. And we know it's so important to people living with dementia to be able to live independently with fulfilled lives and to be able to do things that they enjoy for as long as possible. Um, and we also know that from experts by experience that existing products for people living with dementia can often focus on safeguarding and monitoring and risk mitigation, which of course are vitally important as we sort of build a, a different future for people with dementia. But I think we also forget that there's also about enabling and empowering people living with dementia to keep doing the things that they love and that they're important to them and that bring joy. Um, so I hope to um, inspire you all with this session um, and I will introduce you now to the wonderful Jennifer Butte and Paul Harvey, who are members of our lived experience groups. And we're also joined by, by Carl Quinn, who um, is from the Alzheimer's Society Innovation Team. So we're going to have a, a bit of a discussion now and hope to sort of yeah, set some sparks flying in your brains as you, you build your applications. So Jennifer, shall we start with your experience? Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you use technology now? Yes, um, I was in 2009. My father had dementia and I lived in dementia inclusive communities. I used to be a GP involved in medical education and I'm passionate about AI. <laughs> Because we all want to remain independent and we don't like it when we lose our independence. And as our condition progresses, we find it increasingly difficult. I was involved with the Longitudinal Prize over the last two years, but we weren't allowed to talk about that. Um, <laughs> but I do know a little bit about things. Um, 
now I live in a community which has independent assisted living, nursing care, and others with a dementia and those with advanced dementia and those with just old age, but we all want to continue with some form of independence. I use Alexa, oh help, I should have turned her off, <laughs> to remind me to take my medication twice a day. She plays music. I just have to tell her a bit of one of the songs and she just knows it's wonderful. All that kind of violin concerto by, oh yes, she knows what that is, it's wonderful. And more important for me, she reads me my books because I can't um, read books easily anymore. I've got notes here, you probably gather that, unless I know what it's saying. But, so, but she knows which book I'm reading because I haven't a clue which one I'm listening to at the moment. But she knows and she knows where it is. It's wonderful. The, Alzheimer, the Alzheimer's Society in Amazon did produce an app for Alexa about taking our medication which included not only instructions to take it, but where you actually kept your medication to check that you were doing it. And it all seemed very good, but it fell apart. And I don't know why. So that might be interesting to people because maybe it wasn't marketed properly. I don't know. It was a free app. So why it didn't take off, I have no idea. But taking one's medication is a minefield. So I have reminders on Alexa, on my watch, on my landline phone, the lot, because it is so, so easy to forget. But I also have an iPhone and an Apple Watch that was given to me last Christmas. I said I didn't want one um, because, well, I don't need these posh things, do I? But my son said, you'll never be able to live without it. And he's absolutely right. It tells me, for example, when money goes in and out of my account, which is so much easier than logging on. Logging on to your bank is impossible. You forget how to do it. Um, they do have voice recognition, which does help. But it's a, it's a nightmare. So this has solved a lot of those intermediary steps. So why can't we have more apps that get rid of all these stupid intermediary steps? It also tells me about my exercise or lack of <laughs> and prods me to do it, which is so good. But in a lovely kind of way, you know, they if you do a little bit, oh, well done, you know, now a little bit more. They're so encouraging. It's just brilliant. Um. And it tells me to stand up if I've been sitting down for too long in a very nice way again. So you can have that such a nice to you as well as just turning you up. And my children live abroad and they can know exactly where I am. And you see, that's important because one day, because I get lost, I fell over and hurt myself and I couldn't get up. There's well, no good phoning someone to say I'm, I'm in trouble. Nobody knew where I was. <laughs> but now on this thing, they can actually locate the exact street where I am. And that is so, so important, I think. Um, and then of course I can get phone calls on my watch. If I go out, I don't need to worry that I haven't got my landline with me. It's absolutely brilliant. But I forget directions. And this is something which is, surely people would help. I'll just tell you a little story. I went to Windsor. You've probably heard of Windsor Castle, <laughs> um, wherever you are. And I thought I'd go and visit Windsor Castle and meet some people there. So the arrangement was to meet in the castle. So I got a coach, non-stop, stops at the castle, I was told. But when I got off the coach, where was the castle? I couldn't see a castle anywhere. So I asked the driver, I said, well, where's the castle? Oh, it's easy. He says, you go right, left, turn left, and here you go. right." And blah, blah, blah. Well, I said, I can't remember any of that. Have you got a map? No. Have you got it written down? No. So what was I to do? That's useless. So all I could do was to say to someone, which direction is the castle? Over there. And then don't tell me anymore. I'll set off there. And when I got to there and couldn't go any further in a straight line, I asked someone else. And then I asked someone else. And then I asked someone else. I mean, it's ridiculous, isn't it? There must be an easier way of finding common places, surely. Surely. And then I don't know who people are. I mean, I went to a family funeral two weeks ago. I mean, they're all family, for goodness sake. I mean, I didn't know who my husband was sometimes. I mean, he just laughed. That's the best way of treating me. I mean, my sister brought her phone, came to see me and left her phone here. And when she went outside the door, she said, oh, I've left my phone behind. So I went in to get it. And 30 seconds later, I went outside. There's a strange lady standing outside my door. I didn't know who she was. So I was about to walk past her with the phone. And she said, you're going to give me that phone? No, I'm not. It's my sister's. I'm looking for my sister. Oh, you stupid idiot. <laughs> So 
so what do you do when you don't know who people are and they all get upset about it? I mean, you can get apps on your whatever to tell you what flowers are, can't you? There must be some kind of app to tell you who all these people are, surely. Uh, what else have I got down here? Other situations in which we need help, we can't ask for it, is we forget how to communicate when we're speaking in word salads. We don't speak gobbledygook, we speak word salads. We just take the wrong word off the shelf in the brain. For example, I said to my daughter that the horseshoes were out. Well, she has done psychology and she knows her mum and all the rest of it. And she said, oh, you mean the fox gloves, they're wonderful. But you see, horses and foxes are in the same part of the brain. And shoes and gloves are another part of the brain, aren't they? So when we talk rubbish, it is not rubbish. We're trying to communicate. We're just taking the wrong words uh, off the shelf, so to speak. So we need something to help us with all that. And then we can lose things. I mean, I've got eye tiles. I'm sure you know about eye tiles. You know, they're from Apple. You put them in your glasses. You put them with your what? You put them with your credit cards and all the rest of it, but you need your iPad to be able to locate them. And can I remember how to use the iPad to find these wretched things? No, I can't. You see, there's intermediary stages. People assume that we can do the intermediary stages and we can't. And isn't there some wonderful app? I just I was on some conference a little while ago and it, it um, summarised what everyone was saying in a very short amount. I can't remember what it was called. So I thought this is brilliant. Let me get hold of this thing and then I'll be able to know what's going on in all these conferences. But could I join? No, I could not join. There were too many steps. It was too complicated. And I'm not that daft. Well, I know I am, but now. <laughs> and then spending money, I'm almost there. Um, you can sign up for apps, but it has to be on each outlet. You know, if you want to buy something, you buy 10, you know, dozen tins of baked beans, you know, as for example, I mean, will tell you that you've done that. But suppose you try another shop. Well, that's no good, is it? It needs to be further back than that. And as I just said, I can't remember my passwords, but on my computer, I have an automatic thing to tell me what they are. But the bank don't worry about that. They don't ask me security questions. They just get me to talk, and that's good enough. Why can't we have more apps that just use our voices, please? And my last thing is, don't think that we old people can't cope. <laughs> Covid was wonderful. It got us used to Zoom. And where I was before, I did lots of groups to try and keep people with um, dementia um, stimulated. And I ran poetry groups and memory groups. And of course, during Covid, we were all locked up. It was appalling. I don't live there anymore. <laughs> so was I going to give up? No, I wasn't. And I knew the staff had lots of iPads that never used. So I persuaded them because the staff did like me. I said, please, can you take this iPad around to so-and-so? Um, I'll send you the Zoom, and if you can just set her up on that, and then we can talk to each other and have a little bit of group. So eventually I persuaded more and more people. And in the end, we ran our groups, didn't we? And they were all over 80 and some were 90. So it is not true that older people can learn. That's all I have to say. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And I think just an amazing summary of how much you're already embracing the technology that's available to you and, and, and that we're not starting from scratch and it's how you enhance and connect some of these things together to make it even easier. Um, thank you. Um, we're going to move to Paul now. Hi, Paul. Good morning. Good morning. Would you like to start just briefly, just telling us a little bit about yourself and why you're here today? Yeah, morning everyone. My name's Paul Harvey. I was uh, diagnosed at the age of 48 with Lewy body dementia with Parkinson's. Um, currently 54 now, so I've been living for six years. Volunteer a lot with the Alzheimer's Society in many different forms. Um, and the reason I'm here today is because it's very important, like Jennifer said, about our independence, living independently. And also for my wife as well, that she can go out and have a life, leave me at home. Um, so technology would be brilliant to help with things like that. Thank you. And could you just tell us a little bit about how you use technology now? Yeah, um, 
like Jennifer, I've got an iPad, iPhone, uh, Apple Watch, Alexa. I love me iPad and my iPhone because I don't have to remember any password. I've got face recognition. So it allows me to access everything I want. Um, but the, the big thing is for me, I like cookies still. But I leave the hob on or the oven on. Um, we got over that the hob with an induction hob. So we've got an induction hob that will cut out. The oven is the big bug bearer. I mean, at first, the wife used to say, you know, you've left the oven on. And I said to her, I said, oh, honestly, you keep reminding me. I'm not going to remember. So it gets a bit embarrassing. Just go behind me and check and turn it off. But it'd be nice to know that there'd be some form of technology that could help you with that. So, like, uh, like I said, the wife could go out and visit friends and that lot and not have to worry. Um, yeah, and we're in that stage of the where we are now. Technology is everywhere. Uh, you ain't got to overcomplicate. You ain't got to reinvent the wheel. You know, like Jennifer was saying, there's apps. Um, I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to grasp any new type to, type of technology because my brain won't remember new stuff. It remembers everything old, but nothing new. So, like my iPhone, my iPad, I've had them for a long, long time. So that I know how they work. So I've already got some form of technology. You just need the new apps to go on it, really. And I know when we spoke earlier in the week, you were also talking about how people experience dementia so differently depending on the different type of dementia that they have and how that needs to be built into technology and into the design process to be able to really benefit people. Yeah, um, because there's so many different forms of dementia and this is the complicated part about it. Uh, you'll get your people with uh, vascular, with words and that, but they forget them. Um, so, and that's got to understand their language as well, you know. Um, for me, mine's mobility. So there's different aspects. You've got PCA, don't forget, which is an eyesight thing. So whenever you design stuff, you've got to bear in mind how many different forms of dementia. You're not going to cover them all. No one will. But if you could grasp a quite a few of them, then that would help a majority of people. Yeah, or all, all be much more targeted and 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 aim for a, a, a particular group of symptoms for a particular type of um, dementia to make sure that um, you're really addressing the need there. Um, yeah. You, you can sort of like launch an app and say, this is just for outside, people with Alzheimer's. So you're only targeting one specific dementia and it's only going to help one specific group. But if you could try and collate majority of them, it could help a wider audience. Yeah. Um, and is there anything that sort of frustrates you about technology now? We've heard a few from Jennifer there, but have you got anything to add? Yeah, it's when a new app comes out, you've got to do this step, that step. It's mind-blowing. Just a simple accept it and then you're in would be brilliant. When it gets in and jargon, don't overdo the jargon. Don't be technical in language. You know, a lot of us, I was born in London, I'm a builder, so I'm plain English talking sort of right thing. You know, if you come across with scientific words, it, I'm lost. <laughs> I'll just quit on doing it. <laughs> um, and, and, so, and this call is all about building networks and working together in, in groups and collaboration. Like, how would you like to be included in the design of new technology? 
I think it's key to have people with dementia part involved because obviously that's your target audience. Um, there's so many people out there, you know, through the outside site, you've got an abundance of guinea pigs, if you'd like to say, uh, you know, who would help with stuff like this. Um, just because we've got dementia don't mean that we're silly. We've still got a lot of our intelligence and everything. And uh, they'd even be able to help you with progressing in what needs to be out there. So, yeah, definitely involve people with dementia. Lovely. Thank you, Paul. Have you got anything else to add before we speak to Carl? <sighs> Well, I'd like to say this is a wonderful thing you're doing. And uh, on behalf of everyone with dementia, thank you for looking at stuff like this. Thank you, Paul. And we really, really appreciate you and Jennifer's time this morning because I think it's just so important to have your voices here as we, we inspire those to build networks with um, that include people with dementia. Um, so, Carl, we'll move to you now. So, Carl um, is an innovator in the Alzheimer's Society innovation team um, and has worked a lot or alongside a lot of people affected by dementia in sort of the innovation and design process. So, just a, an opportunity to Carl to share a few reflections on your experience and if there's anything you'd like to add to Jennifer and Paul's accounts in terms of the benefits of involving people affected by dementia in design. Um, thank you very much. Um, and I'd also just like to, to thank uh, Paul and Jennifer for, for their insight as well, um, just because I think hopefully it's given a little bit of a flavour that for those on the call, wherever you are, whatever idea that you have, is that shaping it and framing it in real lives and stories is crucial. And that is a huge part of code design. And understanding different needs and priorities, I think Paul and Jennifer, but Paul kind of articulated very well about the difference of needs and different types of challenges that people have. And using this umbrella phrase of a dementia doesn't really kind of necessarily cut across or tell a story deeply about kind of how the challenges are impacting people on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so it's really crucial that you get to understand the problem space first and foremost is really understand what it is that you're trying to do, stepping away from statistics or potential kind of papers that are kind of framing it as a percentage, actually kind of framing it in the, the real lives of people out there with dementia is an absolute crucial step in understanding and framing the problem you're trying to resolve, whether it is something that cuts across different types of, of dementia or whether, as you said before, Catherine, is diving in deep around one particular strand and, and kind of challenging um, maybe something in depth rather than breadth. So really kind of framing that as a list of priorities that you're trying to, uh, to address. Um, other huge benefits of, of code design it is making sure that you are developing things with real usability and relevance to people living with dementia. Um, any design process, whether you're working with people living with dementia or elsewhere, um, there can be a danger that you follow your own um, your own ideas um, and get kind of quite, quite consumed by those. Um, and then you you end up kind of maybe reaching towards your minimum viable product or, or your kind of proof of concept. And actually it's, it's not usable, it's not relevant to people who you're trying to support. So it is really crucial that you try to engage as, as frequently as possible and as early as possible. Um, because then that can also help with your help with your adoption, of course, when it comes to launch and implementation, um, because you've had people there throughout who naturally become your advocates, they naturally become your case studies. Um, and you know, generally, um, but especially by people with dementia, if it's already kind of been endorsed by other people living with dementia, is it becomes easier for them to buy in that this is actually something that is valuable and is useful for them. Um, yeah, and, and obviously uh, the beauty of working with Alexa, Jennifer and Paul and, and others that we've done through our Alzheimer's Society work is just the sheer kind of creativity and the challenge that they, they kind of provide for you is that it's just wonderful. It just pushes you into a new di direction and really kind of enhances that innovation practice. 
Thank you, Carl. I was about to ask if you had any sort of hints and tips, but I feel like you've covered quite a lot of advice there in terms of um, being open minded and how to involve people. I don't know if yeah. you've got anything else that you'd like to add. I'm just conscious of time. Yeah, no worries. I, I will just just say around kind of inclusion practice and and to be very clear about how you are going to to bring in other voices. So quite often through focus groups, et cetera, you might kind of end up talking to the same people over and over again. So being very clear about how you are being more representative of the people you're trying to reach and trying to support and help is quite crucial. So do think about the different strategies you can deploy and don't think of code design or engagement as one particular method. There are multiple methods to deploy and try to build that into your development plan. Um, and where I would, would suggest that, and, and hopefully Jennifer and Paul don't, don't mind me raising this, is, is please just be patient. Like I said, said, Jennifer and Paul and others, they get it, they understand it. And, and sometimes you might just need to kind of recover certain things and just go through things at a different pace, explain things in a different way, and you will get there. And like I said, the richness of the, the data that you get from, from talking and involving people like Jennifer and Paul it's just a beautiful thing. So um, just to reiterate what Paul's doing, really excited by the potential for this this network. Um, and, uh, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carl. Catherine, I don't know if we've got any questions for our three panellists, if we've got any time for that before we move on. Uh, to... Yeah, I think we can um, do a couple, a couple of questions. Um... OK. Um, yeah, so guys, please do use the Q&A um, function, which you can click at the bottom of the screen to ask questions to our panellists. Um, but we have one here that says, apart from the digital tools or skills, for example, smartphone apps or Alexa, are physical devices such as robots expected to help? And how and what aspects? I don't know who wants to take that one. Paul or Jennifer, have you got any views on robots? Paul's putting his hand up. <laughs> Robots, no, no. Um, that would personally, for me, that would freak me out. Having that that in my home, I'm because you got to remember, I'm used to my surroundings and the people who come and go. To have a new thing come in would unsettle me deeply. So something robotic, and plus you've got to remember spatial awareness comes into it with dementia. Um, with me, I, when I walk, I don't look at the floor. I have to look at my surroundings. So if I feel claustrophobic and too many people around, it tends to put me on the back foot. So no, for a robot, I'm sorry. <laughs> we saw Jennifer looking like she disagreed with you there so yes, i think <laughs> i think robots are wonderful now paul robots don't just look like human beings <laughs> we can have pets that are robots um we have one here you know it's a cat that you stroke and it purrs you know it's, it's a robot it's not um and it and then there's a dog i'm sure you know the story about the dog you know it, it was an expensive dog <laughs> And unfortunately, one day it used to also would bark. Um, and if you called it to you, it would come up to you and it would even jump up onto your nap, apparently. But one day it kind of lay down on the floor and it died. And the residents were so upset. But of course, the batteries had gone. <laughs> but there are lots of robots. And I think the future involves robots, Paul. But they could be parrots. They could be a it could be something on the wall. It could be something hanging from the ceiling or something. They're not like they're not big like human beings. It wouldn't invade your spatial awareness. I think in the future we're going to need robots. Okay, thank you. Um, and we've got one here. Um, which areas of everyday life uh, would you say are more important for researchers to focus on, Jennifer and Paul? Jennifer, do you want to go first on that one? <laughs> well, just basic living, remembering things and who people, for me, remembering to do things. That, I mean, I know I've got Alexa, but you get used to her telling you to do something. You don't ignore it after a while. 
you know, why not have Alexa doesn't do music introductions. Or if you ask her to do music, she'll play you music you don't like. And that's not what I'm asking. And, you know, if you ask her to do something, she says, thank you for your feedback. It's useless, isn't it? There's got to be a simpler thing than that to help remind people as well as just words, I think. And then um, I get lost. So I need something on that, which is everyday stuff, isn't it? I mean, where I am now, it's wonderful. If I don't turn up somewhere, someone will come and find me. But that's, you know, I pay for the benefit of living here, don't I? I live by myself, which I want to as long as possible and be independent. But I need this extra help to live independently. And I forget to eat and drink. You know, I don't get hungry and all that kind of stuff. So these are little everyday th reminders that I need help with, but in a nice way, please. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree on that one as well. Gentle prompts, but daily routines like when you get up in the morning to uh, have your breakfast, then wash and brush your teeth. Silly things like that we forget. Um, for example, to program something to say, like to ring my mum or my dad. Now, if I'm busy doing something, the wife will say, you must ring your mum, dad. And I'll say, yeah, I'll do that after. I forget. Then about 11 o'clock at night, I think, oh, I've got to ring them. Obviously, I can't because it's too late. You know, but things like that, what helps? It's, it sounds silly, but our, our brains are different now. They function differently. So our memory is... It's either you remember something there and then and do it, but if you remember and don't do it, it'll come back at a later time, and it's then it's too late. You know, some general general prompts and try and work a daily routine out as well for it. Thank you. Um, do we have time for one more or? Uh, maybe one one more and then I think we'll have to move on to the, sure, the sure. next bit. Thank you. So Hayden here says, how important is it that your family members are educated around the protocol for care and where do they learn from? <laughs> um, that's been my biggest bugbear since day one of my diagnosis. Um, there's been no help and support for my wife as such for care um nhs really don't involve them on the care side um before we come to the outside side there's questions she need she didn't know what she was facing what could happen with me and that lot there is no such help at all so in your technology i would put that quite high up on the list that the your, your partners were involved in it, that the technology they could put add input into it, you know, add stuff to it. Um, yeah, there's a big high priority for me, Jennifer. Well, it's all to do with education, isn't it? Um, people don't know. I mean, my family are brilliant. They all live abroad. And that's why they're particularly keen on technology, I guess, because they can't be, be with me. And I never phone them ever because of time scales. They always contact me because they can remember the time changes more easily than I can. But the other thing is, um, I have one son in particular who's very good at picking up things. You know, if I say, oh, day's been bad. So he says, well, OK, what can we do to make sure next time this happens, we can do something about it? In other words, we learn from the bad times. And I feel very strongly about education and sharing. So I'm not trying to promote anything, but I do do a weekly blog. Um, a lot of people know that anyway, open to everybody. It has thousands of people following it. Of something that I've learnt this week or last week a problem that has come up and how it was dealt with and how it was well dealt with. So somebody else could be watching all these things. That, well, that's something that we could actually help with the technology. Does that make sense? Possibly. Thank you. 
perfect thank you so much that's been that's been so useful and I feel like everyone's got so many more questions for you and it was really useful insights but I'm sure perhaps well making sure that you obviously involve um people with lived experience is really really important to the network so hopefully you can gather sort of valuable feedback and um use sort of networks that Alzheimer's society have as well um to reach out to people um but yeah thank you again so much that was really useful um to everyone at Alzheimer's society and Jennifer and Paul as well um I'm gonna move on now just aware of time um Jennifer and Paul as well feel free to stay on at the webinar and listen to um the rest of it or also if you need to leave that's that's absolutely fine but yeah thank you so much again Right, I will just share my screen and Sophie and I have some slides which go into a bit more detail about the particular funding opportunity and the requirements. So I will just do full screen um, and I'll just I'll try to go through these fairly quickly so we can have a bit more time for questions at the end. So um, just this slide is just showing where the engineering physical sciences um, are like where our interests are within dementia. So um, we believe that um, there's lots of potential for engineering and physical sciences to help people um, live healthier lives. And that includes all different kinds of conditions and also thinking about well-being in general. So that's where our interest um, has come in this in this area. We have um, this slide is showing our healthcare technology strategy and we have three different um, challenges which are highlighted in blue there so thinking about improving population health of people in general thinking about transforming early diagnosis for people and also discovering uh, discovering and accelerating the development of new interventions and that's where this really uh, this call really fits in around enabling independence for people um, and we have around the outside of this diagram we have some cross-cutting themes that we think are really important for all of our research to um, think about and it should be embedded in all uh, research that we support um, and a couple of things that have come up today I guess um, around sort of patient public involvement and engagement making sure that's really central to the research that we fund and now I'll hand over to Sophie to talk a bit more about the NIHR um, interests in dementia and then we'll move on to go through the call details and a bit more um, information. Thanks, Catherine. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Sophie. I work at the Department for Health and Social Care um, and commission and manage research into dementia and neurodegeneration through the NIHR. Sorry if I have to take a few drinks. Uh, I've been unwell this week, so my throat's a little bit tired. So sorry if I have to pause for a minute throughout. Um, but yeah, just to provide a bit more information on the NHR as a funder, if you aren't as familiar. Um, so the NHR is funded by the Department of Health and Social Care. And the core mission is to improve the health and wealth of the nation through research. So as you can see on the slide, um, the NHR seeks to achieve this through a number of ways. One of which is funding high quality, timely research that benefits the NHS, public health and social care. Also investing in world class expertise, facilities and a skilled delivery workforce to enable us to translate discoveries from research into treatments and services. So that applied research and partnering with patients, service users, carers and communities to improve the relevance, quality and impact of our research. So PPIE is really important to us. Um, and attracting training and supporting the best researchers as well so we can tackle complex challenges in health. And also uh, collaborating with other public charity, public funders, charities and industry like we're doing on this call uh, with the Alzheimer's Society and EPSRC, so we can address some of the biggest research challenges with, within the system. And also we do fund global health research and training as well to meet the needs of the poorest people in low and middle income countries. Next slide, please. Thanks, Catherine. So we thought it'd be helpful just to provide a little bit of information about our pre-existing NIHR dementia research activities, which are generally split up into three work streams. So the first one in the first column is supporting and enabling dementia research. So this is about ensuring that 
England has all the research infrastructure to support innovation in all areas of dementia. So we're able to deliver high quality, efficient and innovative research. And also in the second column, um, we also work quite hard to increase participation in dementia research as well. So um, some of you may all already be aware that um, with charity partners like Alzheimer's Society, we also fund and deliver uh, joint dementia research. Um, and initiatives like this seek to increase the number of people and also the diversity of people participating in dementia research. And this enables us to deliver research which is relevant across a wide range of populations and also speed up the delivery of research as well. And finally, um, we also uh, make sure we're delivering research which meets the needs of the health and care system. So um, making sure that the research we're funding is relevant to those people living with dementia and the carers and families uh, but also meets the needs of the current and the future health and social care system. Next slide, please. So we just thought it'd be a bit help. Um, it'd be helpful to provide a bit of information about where this joint call came from. So. Um, yeah, over a year ago now, in June 2023, um, EPSRC and NIHR, with support and involvement from Alzheimer's Society as well, delivered a workshop which identified opportunities for engineering and physical sciences research in dementia. Some of you might, some of you on the call might have been involved in that workshop. Um, and a number of key themes and opportunities for further research were identified during discussions and activities at the workshop. But one key area stood out rather strongly, um, and that was the need to support people living with dementia to remain independent in the home for longer. So some of the key reflections from this area included, um, so the fact that um, Alzheimer's Society survey showed that 85% of people said they would rather stay at home for longer um, after a dementia diagnosis. So they want to stay there for as long as possible. Um, and care for people with dementia is equally as important as diagnosis and treatment. Um, and systems and tools developed by research to support people to live well should be designed to address people's needs and not be over -compl complicated and should not shift the burden onto carers or the person using that technology as well. And finally, um, technologies and solutions should be implemented to enable people with dementia to live independently in a way that doesn't make them feel abandoned. <clears throat> and as you can see on the slide, um, patient and public involvement is really important and that came through the workshop as well should be embedded throughout oh sorry maybe did you want me to carry on with our with our slides yeah um so uh so we wanted another kind of point that came up um, was that funders should provide opportunities for communities to come together uh, that work from dif in different disciplines um, via a funding call and cross-funder opportunities. So that's where this particular funding opportunity came from. And the workshop report is linked there and we'll share the slides after the webinar as well so you can see, see um, the other comments that people had around that. So the, this is the aim and focus of our call. So it's funding to develop networks um, we call them network pluses because there's some funding to uh, run the plus part is funding to run research projects uh, focused on the development and use of novel technologies and tools to enable people to live independently with dementia and we're looking to build capacity and bring together new interdisciplinary communities across engineering physical sciences health and care because we really want people to be ready to tackle all challenges in uh, dementia research so these are some of the priorities um, within that we've identified within the call. Um, 
So we're particularly interested in networks that look at some of the following um, areas. So technologies to support independence in the home, uh, investigating how feasible and um, how to implement and uh, use existing technologies and tools uh, that are used for uh, different uh, conditions or other, other areas and kind of implement implementing them in the dementia space. Tools and technologies to facilitate and work um, synergistically with health and care professionals and carers. Technology that helps to create a system that evolves with people's needs, as we understand, um, again, everyone's um, different, um, everyone's individual, and um, people have uh, different, uh, I guess, pathways in their journey of um, since receiving a dementia diagnosis and how to support people at different, at different stages of that. And we really want to support people to live well beyond their home, in their communities, um, kind of enjoy, um, enjoy their lives um, and be independent. So applicants will need to consider the following things within that application. So what we're really looking for is for you to build interdisciplinary collaborations and foster that multidisciplinary working. We want you to consider the needs of a diverse range of, um, of different groups and communities. We want you to put the, the needs of uh, patients and um, people with lived experience at the center of networks. We want you to explore and identify pathways and barriers to implementing these tools and technologies so that hopefully um, any technologies developed will um, have a more of a chance of success. And um, as part of the uh, research element, we're really looking for creative, new and exciting um, research ideas. And we would like some of your application to focus on the advancement and development of novel um, engineering, physical sciences research that can really hopefully create a step change um, in this area of supporting independence um, in the home. So moving on, uh, just a few more details about the, the funding opportunity. Um, so this is the funding and the process. So the full economic cost of your project can be uh, 2 million and EPSLC and NIHR will fund 80% of that. The total fund is 6 million for this particular funding opportunity. Your network can be up to three years in length. And we hope that you would use your network to um, build into future larger, um, potentially grant applications or larger projects. Uh, just to um, let you know some key dates. So there's an expression of interest deadline, which isn't mandatory next Friday, uh, 11th of July at 4 p.m. This is just to help us to identify reviewers and plan for demand. Um, the stage isn't assessed and you can change your information prior to the submission of your proposal. Uh, so this is the, um, the full more information on the key dates. So the full proposal stage closes on the 10th of September. Um, and then we will have an expert panel to prioritize the applications in October. And finally, there'll be an interview panel um, in December. So eligibility, we, our standard um, eligibility rules apply and you can find more information on our website. Um, please do get in touch if you have any um, concerns around eligibility and we can point you to the, in the right direction. These are the assessment criteria um, against which the peer reviewers will be assessing your application. Uh, so the vision and approach of the network um, and how it meets the criteria of the funding opportunity, like how it's gonna help uh, people um, to be more independent. Uh, the capability of the applicant and the team to actually deliver the network. The resources that you've requested and how you've justified those uh, to do the network. Um, the ethical and responsible research innovation considerations of the project, the added value of the network plus and the program leadership and management um, of how you will actually manage that network plus, involve all the right stakeholders and distribute the um, plus funds that you will be allocating. And there's a lot more information in the actual funding opportunity. So please do have a look at that. Um, and happy to answer any questions around those. So um, just to highlight that patient and public involvement, as we've seen already, is really important. We'd like you to um, consider uh, sort of health equities in your network. Make sure you're embedding um, actual diverse and um, inclusive voices from patient and public involvement. Uh, we're looking for clear evidence of genuine co-creation, um, embedding um, engagement with patients, people with lived experience and health professionals from the outset of your network application and throughout the lifetime of the network. 
Um, and we're looking for engagement with people from all different and diverse backgrounds, including those from potentially uh, deprived, underserved or underrepresented areas. So um, this are just a few hints and tips about what might make a good application. Uh, so thinking about the scope, making sure how making it clear how you're addressing the funding opportunity, specifically thinking about um, how this is a network um, grant, bringing communities together, um, and it's which is different to a project grant. Um, thinking about how your research will benefit the end users and making that really clear. So how are you going to um, enable that independence for people living with dementia? We're looking for multidisciplinary applications. So we're bringing, we want to bring together different communities. Um, we want you to show how your application has been shaped by key stakeholders. Um, and again, just a, just a reminder to please look at the assessment criteria on the uh, website. And uh, this is my final slide. And then I'll hand over to our Network Plus uh, grant holder to tell you a bit more about how uh, she's found running a network. Um, so just uh, something to bear in mind, we would expect funded networks to establish and maintain links with other investments, um, which are relevant to NIHR, Alzheimer's Societies and UKRI. Uh, for example, there's a, a current um, Economic and Social Research Council, NIHR and Alzheimer's Society Network Plus call, um, which were which um, should soon be announced. Um, and we'd really like networks to establish links with, with these as well. Um, we really want to increase the collaborative working environment across disciplines and connect other people across the research landscape. Um, and that will include sort of working with existing activities um, to create shared opportunities in this area and hopefully build some really great uh, multidisciplinary proposals in the future. So now I'm going to um, hand over uh, to a Network Plus um, holder of one of EPSLC Network Plus grant holders. Uh, so Professor Vicky Lee is a professor of informatics and digital health um, and um, she is the principal investigator and director of the EPSLC Future Blood Testing for Inclusive Monitoring and Personalised Analytics Network Plus. So I will hand over to her now and I will just stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much. And I think, oh yeah, perfect, Vicky. I'll hand over to you, thank you. Great, let me just share my screen first. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, I can see it. Not in presentation mode, but I can see it. Yeah, let me turn yeah. it to presentation. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Right. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, my name is Vasilia. You can call me Vicky. And I'm a professor of informatics and digital health uh, from University of Reading. And I'm currently leading a network called Future Blood Testing Network. And uh, in this 15 minutes, I will briefly share uh, the experience that how we run our network. The full name of our network, you can see, is uh, Future Blood Testing uh, for Inclusive Monitoring and Personalized Analytics network. Um, so our network focused on a uh, um, challenge in the community health and care, and especially we chose the blood testing uh, as a key challenge area because we think the blood testing is always the most common uh, uh, medical test that supports the medical decision making, and a lot of the pathways depend on the uh, efficient and accurate blood testing. Um, but the, the challenge is that is always high demand uh, of the laboratory test from the community setting. And especially uh, when we launch our network, which is 2021, um, and that is when we have the pandemic and people are encouraged to stay at home um, and we have virtual clinics but for the patients who still have to go to hospital to get a blood test done. So especially it's a challenge for a lot of vulnerable patients, for the cancer patient. So that is a key idea we would like to address uh, from our network. Um, so we really want to have a solution that enable the patients and the health professional to carry out the, the uh, blood monitoring or test remotely. So which is beyond just virtual clinics and that will be able to speed up uh, uh, decision-making and uh, in a way reducing the waiting list and other things. And also how to use the data uh, of the remote monitoring that can provide more better personalized uh, decision support at the individual level. 
um, when we think about this challenge and all the possibilities, we realize that it's a really uh, involve all the different uh, expertise, for example, clinical science, engineering, sensing or chemistry or different expertise. And on the other hand, we also need to have a lot of stakeholders in there, patients, most important researchers and clinicians and uh, um, uh, companies. So how to get them together is uh, our key aim of our network uh, to build this community, to bring people together so we can develop technologies um, with a vision of the remote, rapid, affordable, and more inclusive monitoring and personalized analytics. So patients will be able to get, uh, in the future, be able to have the technologies for blood monitoring at home. So with the shared vision, uh, we shared with our partners and our uh, investigators and also patient and the clinicians. So we come up with uh, a future blood testing approach uh, that we envisage at the, uh, the testing at the non-clinical setting and, um, and in, the, in the particular, in the exemplar uh, clinical areas. We have identified the key uh, technical, three key technical areas of our network. Um, so if you look at diagrams so from the remote blood monitoring that, for example, device for, uh, for the uh, blood uh, biomarker identification through ICT for secured uh, data sharing, as well as that AI to, uh, to provide more personalized analytics. So this three, we believe the three, these three key areas together. So we would like to bring in the community to develop new digital health systems. So that address the key technical questions in these three areas um, that in the end, we can support real-time blood uh, uh, monitoring, self-management and uh, timely intervention in the future in the community. So apart from myself as a PI, we also have colleagues uh, from uh, 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 like Rob Barker from Kent, Mark Allen from the University of Birmingham, Jeremy Free from Southampton, and Sergey Corporate from Nottingham as a co-investigators. And we have coordinators, uh, Samantha and Rachel, uh, together in coordinating our network activities. Um, and also we have an international uh, network consortium um, that bringing all different aspects at uh, the advisory board from an international point of view and also have uh, quite quite a few uh, NHS partners, which I think we're really uh, 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 fortunate to have these partners to bring in patient group as well through so the NHS uh, uh, partners and uh, and the companies and other networks that will share uh, their, uh, we were thinking about network networks to share the experience of the, um, uh, the network we ran before. So the network plus fund. So one of the very key areas that in our, in our activity is a network plus fund. So we use a network plus fund to fund research. And the research, we mainly found two types of research. And the first type of research we're looking at is the landscape report. Um, so let's get really looking at what are the existing challenges, opportunities, and what are the recommendations um, uh, in the existing blood testing in the UK. And this funding, as you can see, we have found to the uh, Warwick University and the uh, University Hospital World Coverage and Warwick Share. So really, we looked at the UK Laboratory Diagnostics Landscape Report. So uh, the funding is really useful, and then we're going to use this funding for further poli uh, to influence policy making or regulatory body to really inform the community about what challenge we have and what up, uh, roadmap we're going to move forward to address the challenges. Um, and the second type of the research we use a Network Plus to fund is the, um, is the research project. So we call this collaborative innovation project because we want to let our uh, network members to focus on the co-design either co-design with the patients or co-design with the NHS partners. So that's why we call them as a, a collaborative innovation project. So those pro projects, we uh, focus on the key technical areas, like I just mentioned, uh, AI and ICT, how you use AI um, and uh, uh, technologies to do the prognostic, diagnostic, or the disease trajectories. Um, so this is two projects with King's College in London and Warwick. 
um, and some other project we uh, really focused on the remote monitoring. So how the uh, the uh, portable device or variable device uh, can be used for the disease detection or analyte measurement. So and some other projects, including the not only disease detection, but also the how can you use remote monitoring for the treatment and management, um, and also continuous monitoring for all different blood um, biomarkers. So all of these projects are quite new. So um, um, so we found in total eight projects uh, for the research project. So in total, one landscape report and eight uh, uh, collaborative innovation fund uh, to support the researchers in our network to develop their, their, their research. Um, another part of our re uh, network activity, a quite important part is the network conferences. So we use a ground of network grant to organize our, a series of uh, workshops, in-person conferences and webinars. So for example, we planned three in-person uh, uh, conferences. We had already had two. So we start from 2022, the first in-person conference, we scoped out the uh, challenges, opportunities, um, in the overall uh, uh, landscape. And then we launched our funding call in the first uh, conference as well. And in the second conference, conference 2023, um, so we, we really focused on the key technologies in the key uh, technical areas, remote blood monitoring, mon uh, uh, testing, monitoring AI. And we not only bring the uh, researchers, but also patients. So patient voice can be heard as well in the conference. And in 2024, so this year, we will have our final conference uh, looking at the digital health um, that really look at the future of, uh, uh, of, the, of the future blood testing. So based on what we have fund, funded and what the, all the activities, what would the future gen, research agenda um, in this topic? Um, so the 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 conference really useful to connecting people, but we also found another quite interest uh, useful way to connecting people is a network online webinars. So we organize uh, uh, online webinars every month. So every month we have two webinars. Uh, going on, so uh, so people people join the webinars talking about different research uh, topic. And actually, uh, I, today we have a, a webinar on the biosensing of Alzheimer's disease today at twelve o'clock. So it's all different topics um, that in our network. So it's really useful to bring people together uh, through the online online webinar and share the information. Um, as um, I think, as Catherine sa uh, said, so we the one of the key, as I think, quite 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 good is that formal network. We have run, running it for three years, so uh, quite good to see a lot of uh, group emerging. So a uh, different group emerging with different uh, topics and um, um, and uh, ideas, and they they we support them from small project project. And after three years, I've got a big project. So some we have a lot of uh, members that. Um, uh, secured following uh, uh, fundings, and I use the example of myself as well. So we 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 emerged a consortium uh, from Reading uh, and to hospitals as well as patients together, and from another university from Leicester, Oxford, and uh, Birmingham, and uh, uh, Health Innovation Network from Oxford as well. So we merged the. Uh, consortium together and we look at the using the blood test result and the electronic patient record to develop AI uh, machine learning model to early detect inflammatory arthritis. So that we uh, get support from EPSRC, AI for Health, to develop research, further develop research, and then uh, we got support from NHR to further develop this research into a product uh, for the evaluation. So that is an example. Um, another uh, activities, including the international activities that is not only raise awareness in the UK, but also raising awareness from in the US and Hong Kong as well. Um, so that is quite good. Uh, I think quite good experience to sharing the global innovation model, how to use blood testing and how to uh, um, uh, to promote this uh, uh, to the our research. 
So in a summary, um, so um, I think mainly in for the three years of running this network, I think it's a really good experience. And although we have a lot of fun, uh, a lot of meetings, so we met a lot of people, uh, brilliant people, and it's really good to see the knowledge sharing through our conferences and webinars. Um, and I think really important thing, like as a network coordinator or the leader, is that connecting people. So because some of the researchers they may need. Um, um, they pi pilot the research in the NHS, or uh, they want to hear, hear more the voice from patients, or some company, they may also want connections with, from, for, with the researcher for collaboration. So we connect people uh, together, so they enable the research happening. And another thing is raising awareness. So that's in the end, we build a community and all the different, and we community with all the different consortium for further development. Network Plus Fund, uh, we found a uh, landscape report really useful to uh, to to find use the funding to inform the policy making, and also um, to inform the future research agenda. Uh, for the innovation fund, some other network call it feasibility study, um, but I think it's really useful to support early career researchers who has brilliant ideas but who doesn't have a lot of resource to develop the research. But this would be good opportunity for them, and also for translational research that gives them opportunity to opportunity to develop proof of concept um, uh, research so so that they can apply for larger funding in the future. So yeah, so that is overall uh, experience um, in, in a nutshell that in the, how we run our network. Um, if you want to know more about our network, how we run it, you can go to our website or you can email me for if you have any questions. So that's all, thank you. Thank you so much, Vicky. That was really, really helpful to hear from your perspective about running the, the Network Plus. Thank you. I think um, we're going to do the question and answer now. I think, Vicky, do you have time to stay on the panel? Perfect. Thank you. So I'll hand over to Olivia, who's going to um, have a look at the questions for us. I should have mentioned, actually, that you can upvote uh, the questions. If there's one you particularly would like us to answer, you can select that in the Q&A section. Yeah, people have been doing that, but good to announce to, to the rest. Um, so we've got a question. Will this call provide funding for postdoctoral research associates? Uh, yeah, I can um, answer that one. So yes, uh, we will fund uh, postdocs um, on the grants. Um, obviously, you just need to make sure you're justifying um, what their role is on the grant. Um, we will expect you to, um, I suppose you might need resource for those as part of your feasibility studies. Uh, so you can cost this under directly incurred costs um, and they can be funded there. Okay, thank you. Um, and can the lead applicant be from an NHS trust or a provider of NHS services? I think that was on one of the slides, but someone with some clarification. Uh, yes, so they can be from an NHS trust. Uh, they just need to have um, a research uh, component at that NHS trust. Um, there is some more guidance on our website, so I can link that when we circulate the frequently asked questions. Um, so there are some specific eligibility criteria, but you can, um, in effect, be an NHS trust lead. That's, that's why we have had that before on our, on our grants. And how can technology partners, private companies be, be part of this network? Sorry, I think I might cut out there if you need me to repeat no, that. No worries, thank you. Okay, no, good. I think I heard about, um, so, so how can companies be involved in the network? Uh, so within EPSLC grants, um, industry uh, can't be an investigator on a grant, uh, so they are not eligible, uh, but you could uh, be a partner, a partner as part of the grants, um, you could also, if there was a specific, um, I guess, expertise that you required as part of the feasibility studies that you're carrying out, you could also request costs uh, through subcontracting costs, which um, I can also link to um, the information about how you cost that in your application as part of the FAQ document. So they can, they cannot receive um, funding um, directly, uh, but there are some ways in which you you could uh, be involved as part of the as part of the project can we have a, a co-investigator and or researcher who is not working in the uk 
Um, so again, um, with the EPSRC uh, rules, you cannot have um, all investigators need to be UK based. So you wouldn't be able to have an international um, co-investigator on that award. They would again have to be um, a partner or, for example, you could have a visiting researcher that, that came over or you could um, have some funding for some um, I guess they could part participate in a workshop, for example, as part of the network, but they couldn't be an investigator on the grant. Again, I, there's some more specific guidance on our website, which I can also link to as part of the FAQs. Thank you. Um, and someone's wondering, how can I connect with relevant academic partners to apply for this grant? Um, so I, that was actually we were gonna we were going to um, say we will probably send around an, an email after this webinar. Um, if people would like us to share their contact details, we do have all everyone's emails that's registered for the webinar. So if people are happy with that, then we would be delighted to share everyone's contacts. But I will just double check for GDPR reasons if um, if people are happy happy to do that. Yeah, and you, you could also consider putting your details in the chat now as well. I've seen a few people have already done that. Um, and I've got a question for Vicky. So do you have any key advice for writing the application, which involves so many partners? Uh, right. I think the key advice is really you need to address the challenge. So you, you really have clearly articulate the challenge you want to address, a, a, a specific challenge you want to address. Although we normally we have um, uh, we, we may have a lot of partners, but we need to make really make sure what are the contribution of partners. We can't just just involve partner because they are they are have a big name on the things, but they need to have relevant expertise. They can provide the right support uh, for the uh, for the applications, and so that is a key thing. So there are partners you can involve, but you need to make sure these are right partners and why they need yeah they are needed in the application um, so can they help to uh, support the feasibility studies can help to provide advice from industry point of view so um so that is the right expertise for the partners are quite important and um, and then but i think the core thing is that what are the unmet um, need you want to address and what are the key technology you want to focus on and then find the partners that have they are relevant to your questions and also te uh, technical challenges. Thank you. Um, and can the lead named on the expression of interest be changed to another for the full application? Yeah, that, that's fine. Um, you, if you just let us know, um, just so that we can make sure that we've identified all possible conflicts when we're assembling our panel. But yes, you can you can change the lead. That's That's absolutely fine. Sorry, people are popping their details in. It's <laughs> back and forth. Uh, can you be an applicant in two different submissions? Um, yes, you. We haven't put any any rules around that, so you could um, effectively, yeah, be an investigator in in different submissions. That's fine. I guess we wouldn't expect you to be a lead on two submissions because, um, but you may want to be, you know, involved involved with others as a co investigator as part of other networks. That that would be okay. Is there a minimum requirement for the number of project partners to be involved in the network? There isn't a requirement. Um, I guess the way in which um, project partners are assessed is, um, I guess, as part of the applicant and project team um, assessment criteria. Uh, so you're thinking about um, why they're partnering, what value they'll give to the network, um, that's more of what the panel will assess you against, not the number of uh, partners that you have. And obviously, we would hope that all partners um, as part of the network um, would be yeah, having a particular role to play and would provide value. For example, uh, you know, you could have patient, um, a patient organization, for example, and you could show the value because you need to connect to those individuals as part of the um, PPIE um, element of the proposal. Um, so it's just really about demonstrating why you have that partner, what the value is, um, but not necessarily the number of partners. We don't have a specific requirement on number of partners. Are you able to comment on health economics input to address value for money concerns? 
Uh, so I don't know if anyone from LHR has more more details on this. It's not in my sort of expertise area, but we could um, also share some more details as well afterwards if there's some helpful guidance that perhaps uh, NHR have on that. But I'll yeah hand over to Sophie for that one. Yeah, we we referenced this in the research specification about possibly including economics expertise in in networks. Um, yeah, one of the areas we were particularly interested in was how and where um, technologies and tools can be effectively implemented into the current health and social care system. Um, and one of the key factors for doing that is, yeah, how how effectively can that be done um, economically? Is it, is it good value for money? Um, so that those sorts of factors. Um, so that was our kind of thinking there. But it's obviously if it's relevant to your project. And someone's just asked to repeat the answer to is the 11th of July EOI mandatory? No, it's not, it's not mandatory, but we would hopefully, hopefully if you can let us know if you're applying, that would be really useful to say that we can plan. The, um, just to say as well, the EOI is literally, I think it's just, um, just your name, your organisation and just the kind of area that you're going to apply to. But um, so we don't expect a lot of information in there, but it's just to really let us know that you're applying. Um, but no, it's not mandatory, just to be yeah clear. Thank you. Can those involved as team members apply for the network fund bids? So uh, yes, they can, but I guess we would expect there'll be some independent review of that application where they weren't involved. Um, there will be a grant condition on each of these networks, which explain how you're expected to distribute um, your funds as part of the PLUS funding. Um, and I guess we would expect you to, to adhere to the same sort of peer review principles that EPS or CNN HR um, adhere to um, when you're delivering that, giving out that um, feasibility funding. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Um, are fellowships allowed? And if so, can some of them be pre-identified? Uh, I guess I'm a little bit confused by that by that question. Um, I guess because this is more about um, a network grant. So it's more about connecting different, um, different uh, disciplines together. Uh, so I guess if you're interested in fellowships, um, please do get in touch. There's a different, obviously separate fellowship scheme. Um, that you that you've been involved in sorry if i've misinterpreted that that question um just not 100 percent um yeah what 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 that one means sorry again just people putting their um, details in the chat which is really useful um i'm a researcher so sorry what is the desired outcome for this round of funding technology proof of contract concept in controlled environment or fully deployable solution to multiple users? Uh, so we wouldn't expect it to be a fully um, deployed solution. Um, we are hoping that because um, we do fund early stage research, um, we would like a lot of the ideas to be novel, novel research. Um, we want you to think about the um, how you're going to deploy the technologies, but we would expect it to be um, early research that you um, come that you uh, form that the ideas you form are with the partners as part of the network so we're looking for like new creative novel solutions to this problem we're not looking for fully deployed uh, solutions which could be funded through other through other schemes yeah i was just going to add that um this this investment might contribute towards future projects like vicky set out her network had then gone on to obtain other grants and projects elsewhere so for example in the nhr we have the invention for innovation program um which is has a particular focus on translational research funding projects so yes yeah, i'd say think carefully about what you want to achieve with the network but we don't yeah, we anticipate that this work might lead on to other projects and funding elsewhere. Does the network lead need to be from an EPSRC discipline? No, they, they can be from any discipline. Um, we funded people from all different disciplines. Um, that's absolutely fine. As long as you've got the expertise to lead the network and um, collaborate with all the partners and deliver the vision for the network, that's absolutely fine. You can be from any discipline. 
can we cost an industry partner in the grant? So again, you the only cost that you can apply for for industry would be through subcontracting costs, but these are quite rare. Um, they'd have to be a small part of the um, application and they'd also have to be, um, you'd have to justify why you need that expertise as part of a network. Um, so for example, I don't know if you, um, I think I mentioned before, if you wanted to use a particular piece of industry equipment or something like that, something very specific, uh, you could cost that in. Um, but again, I can share details of um, how you can involve industry in EPSLC applications. I'll put the link the link to that in, in the FAQs. So we've got one area in scope is using existing technology and extending its use in dementia. Is the anticipation that the project team in this case would still be led by those with their primary expertise in dementia, or would it be okay to have the researchers with dementia expertise as co-leads and the PI to be the lead in technology? Let me know if you'd like me to repeat that. Uh, so I think it um, it it depends on what what you want to deliver as part of your project. Um, we won't stipulate which um, what expertise the PI or or co eyes need to have. You just need to justify why you need that expertise um, and why you're going to uh, why this will help you deliver the vision for your particular network. Um, so we don't have any specific requirements on who who would lead lead a network again. Um, just that you've justified it. How much of our focus should be about linking with statutory provision versus industry-led innovation? Um, okay, so again, um, we've sort of left this to the um, <laughs> to the academic community and the community to define this. So it would be whatever you, I suppose, whatever you think your where your technology would have the most benefits and which um, system you would tap into. Um, hope that made sense I think it's all about yeah you justifying um what you're going to do and the pathway to implementing that um but we don't have a specific requirement around that so how does the funding work for technical projects within the network are network members allowed to receive this funding or do the projects need to be planned at the network plus application stage uh, so no, the projects don't need to be planned at the um, application stage. You can have broad areas that you are thinking of um, going into within the application stage. Um, but we would expect that the uh, projects that are funded through the network are formed from collaborations and network members and people that are coming in. So we wouldn't expect you to have fully formed projects yet. You, it would be through the developments and conversations and networking you do as part of the network. So that's kind of the idea of the call to get all this expertise together so you can come up with that those like new creative ideas. And then you would apply for the funding to then be able to do those once you've sort of defined topics um, more in depth as part of your network conversations. The aim of the network is to enable independence for people with dementia. However, is developing a solution to support carers, so both informal and formal carers, within the scope of the call? So, yeah, so did you want to yeah, take this? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, we kept it quite broad in terms of, yeah, people living with dementia could be benefited from this call or their, their family members, yeah, both those um, caring for them, uh, professionals within the, the health and care system coming into the home, caring for them. Um, because we also um, talked about supporting people outside of the home as well, whether that's to use transport, take part in um, and be part of public spaces. Um, and carry on living independently and living as normal a life as possible. So it is very much broad in terms of who those benefits can um, apply to. Would the fund allow experimental research or is it purely to build the network? Um, so I guess that's what the PLUS funds are for. So um, that's that's where the experimental research comes in. Um, so the network is to build the capacity and the partners, and then the plus funds is to test out some of the ideas that you've had to then do the experimental uh, research as part of that. So yeah, we would encourage that creative experimental research. 
as part of your network. So does this mean that the vision should focus on how to establish the network instead of a research vision? Uh, yes. So it's about the network. The, the the call is around the yeah the network and why 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 you need a network for this for this particular area. Are you hoping to discover new innovations that might see the light of day in the real world, or is this purely academic research? So I guess because it's, um, I guess the research that we will probably fund is still going to be quite early stage, I guess, um, within the three year time scale um, of the network, I wouldn't expect solutions to be fully deployed. Um, but there might be some, um, you know, prototypes or pilot, um, pilot work that could, that could, um, pilot studies that could initially be deployed, deployed, but we wouldn't expect it to be, um, fully formed and developed actual technologies that are in actually working in people's homes. Yeah, but at the same time, um, I mean, other people might have had in investments in this area for a number of years now, so might be a little bit further along with um, the kind of tools or technologies or projects that they're looking at. So again, they might be moving more towards the implementation stage and looking at the feasibility of that within the health and social care system. So. Yeah, it's quite broad in that in that sense. That's true. Sorry, Sophie. Yeah, we've had we did. Yeah, keep it broad. So there could be, it, they could be at different stages of research. The the different projects that you that you're looking at. So someone said, "I'm a researcher currently working in another field, but very interested in this opportunity. Do I have to set up a limited company and partner with university and then the NHS? They'd like some guidelines around that." Um, okay, so it depends on your eligibility uh, to apply. Um, so I would recommend you check our website to see if you're eligible as an investigator on the grant. Um, again, you can post in the chat if you want to collaborate with any others. That's absolutely fine. If you come from a different field, that's great. We're looking for those new those new disciplines and people involved in this field. So that's that's great. Um, again, I would just, um, yeah, if you can check the website and just check that you're actually eligible to apply. Um, if you've got any other queries, please do get in touch uh, with with us. Um, I think, I, I, well, I'll circulate the um, inbox where you can ask, ask more questions. So if you've got further clarifications, I can answer those. Yeah, it is already on the research spec as well, Catherine, isn't it, the email address, so. Um, I'll put that in the chat now. Can local authorities participate in a bid and can their participation be funded? So, for example, having their travel costs covered? Uh, yeah, so travel costs can be covered. Um, they can't be um, an investigator on a grant. Um, Again, uh, just due to our eligibility criteria, but there are things like yeah, their the travel costs or costs to participate in workshops that that can be covered. And again, I guess they'd be really important people to yeah involve in your networks and, and partner with. But if you've got more specific questions, again, please get in touch. If there's a specific question you have around a partner, please please get in touch. Uh, will more local or regional network pluses be funded, or only national ones? Um, I suppose it, it'll vary. Some people will be uh, collaborating nationally, whereas others might focus a bit more regionally in specific areas, depending on what the focus of the network is. Um, and uh, yeah, where, where the networks bring most value. So it's quite broad in that sense, I think. Do you agree, Catherine? Yeah, sorry, I couldn't find my own meat. Um, yes, yes, I agree. Um, yeah, we haven't stipulated that, but it would just be about where your where your partner's expertise and the vision for your network. So we would expect a bit of a yeah, a, a mix of um networks. Yeah, but we we did in the research specification talk about um the importance of considering health inequalities in your mm -hmm. applications, um, and also working with those individuals. Um, in greatest need and who who may actually benefit most from um, kind of this work. So you might consider where can you have the greatest impact in the UK and in, in England um, 
so where the prevalence of dementia is highest or these sorts of factors might be something that you consider as you develop your applications. I think we've got time maybe for one more question, um, just because it's it, the webinar sort of closes at 12. So we'll have one more question and then I promise we'll answer all your questions that we haven't answered via the FAQ document. Okay, so the final question, can a single person project such as early detection of dementia using AI based methods be submitted in this call? No, so I think if it's about um, early diagnosis or detection, that's not really what we're looking for as part of this call. Um, please do reach out to us though um, if you would like to discuss a research idea. Um, we do have other funding mechanisms open within EPSC and NHR, um, so it might be that there's a, there'll be another place for your uh, proposal, but it sounds like that, that that isn't really focusing on the enabling and dependent side of things. Um, but yeah, so please reach out if you want to discuss any project proposals. Okay, that, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, we will um, circulate slides, uh, webinar recordings, and we will publish a um, frequently asked questions document as well with all of the answers for the questions we haven't got round to answering. So I just want to thank you so much for your lively participation, lots of questions, and thank you to the panel members as well. And um, yeah, everyone for joining us today. So hope you have a brilliant rest of your day and look forward to receiving all of your brilliant applications in the uh, funding opportunity. So thank you so much, everyone. Thanks everybody. Thank you. I'll stop recording actually. <laughs>